And uh, Hebrews, we are in uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse 9 today. As we journey through the book of Hebrews with my... my uh, t- t- assumption that the book of Hebrews is the last call for the kingdom for those who are in the Jewish nation. That is to say that the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews. Hebrews. Thank you. I just uh, make sh- want to make sure you understand that. Uh, and uh, if you're not a Hebrew, then that is to say that... Uh, the, the book of Hebrews will have lots of insight, insight which has application into your life, but you'll, you'll trip over something if you directly apply it. Uh, when you directly apply it, then you're going to end up taking that which is a message to someone else and applying it to you, and you'll end up in, uh, in, in, a, in a challenge. There's a little saying that uh, helps you understand this that says, all of the, uh, 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 make sure I can get this right now, all of the Bible is for me, but not all of the Bible is to me. Uh, and you can take the Bible and say, well, this is for me, and I can take it, I can learn from it, I can grow from it, but it's not necessarily to me. Uh, when it's to you, that's when you get into name it and claiming it, and, uh, and uh, on, on, the, on one side, and the other side is you get into legalism uh, because you begin to take uh, uh, instructions that weren't to you, uh, and you, you put those together. But how in the world would we understand the whole story if we didn't have all of that in there too? So we take that, and certainly there's uh, application that comes then indirectly. So uh, last week we made it uh, through uh, verse 8, and you may remember that the writer was saying uh, to the Hebrew nation, he's saying, look, uh, we listen to the prophets in, uh, in, in chapter 1, we listen to the prophets, and he says, but Jesus is greater than all those prophets or those messengers, and if every time those prophets spoke and we disobeyed, we ended up paying the consequences, how shall we escape if we neglect listening to this greatest prophet who now is here and the salvation that he offers in the establishment of the kingdom for Israel, how, is we, how are we as a nation going to escape then if, uh, if we neglect Neglect this, and then he. It's as as if he answers an objection, and someone raises their hand and say, "Wait a minute! You're calling him the greatest, uh, uh, the, the greater than the prophets. You're calling him the Messiah, and yet he hasn't established any kind of kingdom. He uh, died and uh, was buried. Even if you say he rose again, uh, he doesn't have a kingdom. And the Messiah is to have all things in subjection under his feet, and he doesn't. And Paul." the writer, says, exactly, he doesn't, yet. And that's where verse uh, uh, 8 is in chapter 2. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that all things are in subjection under his feet, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under him. So that's where we left off last time, is why aren't we seeing all things under him if you claim that he is the Messiah? So what do we see if we see Jesus but not all things put under him? That's where verse 9 comes in, and he says in verse 9, but we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Uh, here's what we do see. We don't see all things under subjection under his feet, do we? Uh, you could, if I allowed you to have a little uh, discussion time this morning, I could say, tell me something you saw this week that gives evidence that Jesus does not have all things under subjection objection. And every one of you could come up with an example, couldn't you? Uh, It wouldn't be hard, as a matter of fact, to say, well, here's something that clearly shows Jesus doesn't have subjection over all things. He's not exercising his reign. He's not ruling the nations with a rod of iron. And you could give those examples. So we don't see all things under subjection under his feet, but what do we see? We see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. This is what we do see right now. Now, uh, verse 9 is, a, uh, is kind of a complicated Greek sentence, and uh, the Bible's full of complicated sentences, isn't it? Uh, which, uh, which means that uh, almost any, any scripture you come to, you should be a little careful 
uh, just assuming you already know what it means, uh, because it can uh, these some of these uh, sentences, especially in the New Testament, can uh, can be it seems like three paragraphs long in one sentence, uh, and you really have to take the to, the work to uh, to do these out. But a uh, a, a sentence. To uh, give you grammar lessons, I am the uh, closest uh, thing to a uh, grammar teacher who's also a pastor that you've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, that's, I didn't used to be, but I came to the point that uh, I realized God gave us words, and if he gave, gave us words, I got to know grammar. So uh, a sentence you remember from early grammar school, a sentence has to have two things in it, and that is, as we used to call it then anyway, a subject and a verb, right? And without a subject and a verb, you can't do, you can't really have a complete sentence. And so every now and then you'd write a, a sentence and she would say, that's an incomplete sentence. What's the problem? It doesn't have a subject or a verb. Something's, uh, so something's wrong. You know, running is not a sentence. <laughs> running to the store is not a sentence. <laughs> Somebody's got to do the running, right? Uh, so John is running to the store. That's fine. That's a complete, uh, or John is running for the, uh, that uh, matter, uh, is a uh, complete sentence. So the subject and the verb, when you get into a long scripture, that's always the thing to look for. And in verse 9, Jesus, of course, is the subject, uh, and, uh, and, and the verb is uh, crowned with glory. So Jesus crowned with glory. That means that the part in between there in verse 9, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that's a parenthetical statement, really. Uh, and that's describing Jesus, but don't, uh, don't make, the, don't make the, uh, the secondary thing the main thing, right? Uh, and I, I certainly don't want to tell you that the fact that he's a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death is is secondary to our faith. Clearly it's not. But primary to the argument here is Jesus is crowned with glory and honor. Crowned with glory and honor in spite of the fact that all things are not in subjection unto his feet. Uh, so we do see Jesus now crowned with uh, glory and honor. Uh, and uh, yet at the same time, uh, what we have for the Hebrew nation is they were only seeing him as made a little lower than the angels, or again, I'm going to say messengers. That is to say, they were only seeing Jesus as a defeated rabbi, as one whom the nation rejected, that was uh, put to death upon the cross, uh, that, uh, you know, they mocked at him, and they said, well, he said he was the king of the Jews. That's all they were seeing. And Jesus says, uh, excuse me, the writer here says, that's, you're right, that happened. He was made a little while lower than the angels. Uh, and again, I want to use the word messengers there. He was made a little while lower than the messengers. I mean, he was, uh, not, not only did he not appear to be superior to the prophets, he appeared to be lower than all the prophets. Uh, you're right in that. But now I want you to look beyond that. Where is Jesus now? What's his role now? And what is his status now? And he begins to convince them that he is crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God he should uh, test, uh, 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 excuse me, taste death for every man. So uh, the Hebrew nation just, uh, just wasn't getting it. They were, they were getting caught up on the fact that, well, he's, he's a little lower than the messengers. Uh, and so uh, here we see this, uh, this Jesus that, uh, now, now to go back to that clause, who is uh, made a little lower than the angels for the uh, suffering of death. He, his, uh, his, his uh, little lower, uh, I've got this out of order on your outline, uh, so we'll, I'll just take it in the order I've got on the outline. But he was made a little lower, which we'll d discuss here in just a moment. But he was uh, crowned, and why was, uh, why was he uh, crowned? Here it says, uh, 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 for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Now the word for there uh, is, uh, is actually through. The word is dia. Uh, so through the suffering and the death, he was crowned with glory. And that was a point that the Hebrew nation was missing. And it's a point that they needed to understand. And it's a point that uh, really in one sense was not a surprise. Because you could know from the Hebrew scriptures 
uh, before Jesus ever came, there were a lot of things you could know about him, right? He was going to be born in Bethlehem. He was going to be born of a virgin. Uh, he was, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, a great teacher, a miracle worker, all these things that you could know about him ahead of time. But you could also know about him ahead of time that he was going to be rejected and he was going to die. You see, really the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was no surprise if you study the Old Testament uh, closely. Like Isaiah 53 is the uh, chapter about the, anybody remember? We call it the suffering servant. Yes, the suffering servant. So uh, he was despised and rejected of men like a lamb led to the slaughter. These are Old Testament prophecies that are speaking of the Messiah. Uh, Psalm 22, he was numbered with transgressors and his grave was among the rich. Uh, they uh, gambled for his clothing. All of that uh, is Old Testament. Even the words that Jesus spoke on the cross, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a quote from Psalm uh, 22 or 69, I've forgotten. Uh, and uh, so so all of this, uh, this was in there, and the writer here is saying, look, it is through that suffering and death that Jesus is now crowned with glory and honor. So what he's saying is, don't reject him because he suffered and died. That's what the prophet said was going to happen to him. And, uh, and, and the Jewish people uh, and the Jewish nation then at that time, and in, in, in large part even today, was rejecting Jesus as Messiah because Messiah is supposed to reign. And Jesus wasn't reigning. Uh, he was rejected. He died. This isn't Messiah. But the problem is they're missing some of, uh, some of, uh, some of that. It's, uh, it's maybe a selective reading or it's a uh, temporary blindness or whatever you want to uh, uh, attribute it to. But nonetheless, they're missing that particular point. So uh, he uses this, uh, this word that, again, in uh, King James is translated for, uh, for the suffering of death, was crowned with glory and honor. And uh, yet I, I really like uh, the word through. He would not have been crowned with glory and honor had he not suffered and died. In fact, we could say in a different way, he could not be the Messiah had he not suffered and died because he wouldn't have fulfilled the prophecies. And uh, uh, this, is, this is the blindness, I think, uh, that uh, comes apart uh, to, to the Jewish nation then and now is, look, it is through that suffering and death that you say this is the reason he's not the Messiah. That's exactly the reason he's crowned with glory and honor today and will come back and reign someday. So this is the point he's trying to uh, uh, argue. Um, and uh, back to... Uh, Back to that word through, uh, I, um, I want to talk about it a little bit because I like it. Uh, and it's the uh, Greek prefix dia. This is your Greek, the Greek portion of your lesson for today. Uh, the, uh, the word dia. And, uh, of course, we get diameter from it. Uh, and uh, diameter means, uh, to, you know, to go right uh, all the way through it. What's the, what's the, what's the measurement? M meter is metros. So it's, uh, it's to measure. And uh, what's the, the measurement straight through it? That's the diameter. Uh, and uh, dia, there's lots of, lots of words in dia. I uh, spoke, was it Wednesday night? We talked about the kata words and lots of English words that are cat or kata, uh, like catapult and, and catastrophe and all these. Uh, but uh, there's lots of English words in dia, too. And dia, or sometimes just di, uh, are always rooted in Greek. And they always mean through something or really more precisely thoroughly something, uh, often in uh, Greek, that it's thoroughly whatever it is. Uh, and uh, I've given you a few examples here like a diagram. Uh, diagram is, comes, uh, comes from uh, graphene. Uh, and graphene is to work right, like you have your autograph, uh, and uh, we get uh, it, it uh, in a different form becomes uh, like gram as in grammar uh, and uh, grammatical and all those things. So diagram is to thoroughly write something. And if you think about it, if you, you, you write me a sentence and I say, I don't understand it, and you say, well, I'll tell you what, let me draw you a picture. <laughs> and in the words, Combined then with the picture, you have a diagram, and a diagram thoroughly writes it, right? Uh, in a little bit in our uh, service, I'm going to uh, show you uh, some pictures that uh, are what I envision for uh, this room someday. And uh, guess how we got to those pictures? I sent a guy a diagram, 
and uh, I'll, I could show you sometime the diagram that I sent. It looks nothing like the pictures that he came up with. Uh, <laughs> because mine was a little stick, uh, you know, uh, right in here, you know, a lines here and a, a word here and an arrow there, all that. And from that, this guy that I've never seen face to face who did this, he, and he's never been in this room, he was able to say, ah, this, I, I know thoroughly what you want because you diagrammed it. Now, I could have done that in words and probably written like 300 pages trying to describe and then no telling what he would have come up with. But that diagram, it's uh, thoroughly written out. Uh, uh, diabolic and diabetes, by the way, are uh, th the same root word. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if any of you have diabetes, you might say, well, I understand why they're the same root words, diabolic. <laughs> but uh, it comes from, uh, it's, it's uh, thoroughly to throw, actually, thoroughly to throw. Uh, balos is the word uh, throw, uh, like we get the word ballistics uh, from that. And uh, so thoroughly thrown is what, is what the word is. Now, uh, you say, well, how do we get, uh, let's, let's take diabolic, first of all. How do we get diabolic from that? Uh, the, the, the role, according to the scripture, the role of the devil uh, for the brethren is that he is what? He's, well, he is diabolic. <laughs> but there's a title in the scripture that we call him the something of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren, that's right. Now, what does an accuser do? <laughs> throws things at you. <laughs> and uh, throws all these, uh, these things, you know, seeing what'll stick. And from this we get diabolic. It's a, it's a word that means, you know, thoroughly thrown at, basically. And this is what the devil does, is he's always accusing uh, us. He's the accuser of the brethren. Uh, and uh, diabetes, by the way, uh, I won't go into too much detail here, but uh, uh, the uh, doctor could tell us that uh, if you... Uh, if you continually uh, go to the bathroom, <laughs> uh, you are thoroughly throwing things out of your body <laughs> that uh, this is a sign you've got diabetes. <laughs> and uh, so uh, it, uh, it is that uh, thoroughly thrown there. Uh, uh, one more. This, these have so much little to do with the lesson, and yet I want you to feel smart when you leave. Uh, <laughs> diagonal. Uh, comes uh, from, it, it is the third, thoroughly gonia, and uh, gonia is the word for an angle. Uh, so diagonal is, is as thoroughly angled, is what it is. Uh, or through an angle, you could say either way. And uh, gonia, by the way, is where we get the, the, uh, the English word knee, gonia. And uh, the knee is what? It's an angle. <laughs> it makes an angle, right? Uh, so it's your knee. It's your angle. Uh, and uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you break it, you, then you have a diagonal knee, right? <laughs> but, uh, uh, so what uh, I, I, I uh, hammer all that home, one, because I love words, uh, but uh, two is to point out that it does say again in verse 9 that he was made a little lower than the angels, and then it is through the suffering of death, he was crowned with glory. Be careful of the way the commas are in there. It might uh, confuse you a little bit. Uh, but made a little lower than the angels. And being a little lower than the angels then, he suffered uh, and, he, and he died. But it was through the suffering of death that he was crowned. So uh, he's saying to the Hebrew nation, don't discount his suffering and death. Don't use his suffering and death to reject him. It's actually through his suffering and death that he was crowned with glory and, uh, and, and with honor. Uh, this is, this is uh, one of the reasons that anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ, a Christian, actually, I'm going to use the word celebrates, celebrates the death of Jesus, don't we? Other deaths we commemorate, but Jesus' death we celebrate. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we, we celebrate it, of course, in a number of different ways, uh, and, and certainly there is a, a sorrow that comes with his death. For example, when we come to the Lord's Supper and it's in remembrance of me, it, it, in some senses you'd say, well, we, that's not a celebration, that's an observance. Uh, and in, in a sense, uh, you are right there, but uh, also, uh, maybe even this morning, I, I think, uh, we often sing songs that really, in a sense, celebrate his death. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, what about a song like, uh, 
There is power, power, wonder worked in power in the blood of the Lamb. That sounds more like a celebration song than a, than a commemoration song, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, you're celebrating. In fact, uh, when the musician leads us, they always want us to, you know, emphasize power, power, <laughs> and uh, uh, really get with it. That's, uh, that's the old-time Baptist uh, coming out of me, right? Uh, and... Yeah, good, good. And old-time country Baptist, then it's power, power, wonder-working power, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, I think the hymnal even spells it that way. <laughs> P-O-W apostrophe R. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, and you can tell I grew up Baptist, didn't you? <laughs> I can't just. So. But that's a, that really is a celebration of his death. Now it's an odd thing to celebrate someone's uh, death. We 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 uh, we kind of try to do it in the Christian life when one of our loved ones dies, and uh, often uh, you know in the in the announcement or the funeral folder or whatever, it might say, you know, a celebration of life. Uh, but I've never seen it say a celebration of death. <laughs> we, we're, we're trying to forget about the death, even at a funeral, and celebrate the life. Uh, and yet with Jesus, certainly we celebrate and remember the life, but there's something about that death we celebrate. And I think it's because Christians get this point that it is through his suffering of death, that he was crowned glory with glory and honor. Now, what would have happened, uh, uh, this is a, uh, uh, one of those, uh, I'll just call it a, a stupid question, <laughs> because, uh, because it's an impossible scenario, but what would have happened had Christ not died? Then, according to scripture, he would not have been crowned with glory and honor. Uh, in fact, Philippians uh, chapter 2, doesn't it say? I'm going to have to paraphrase here. But uh, it uh, says that uh, uh, he, he took on uh, uh, human uh, form, human flesh, and he was obedient even unto suffering of, uh, even, uh, even, he was obedient even unto death, uh, so that he might be given the name that is what? Above all other names. And so that Philippians passage basically says the same thing here, that it is his suffering and death that gave him the name above all of the names, or it is his suffering of de uh, and death that crowned him with glory and honor. Now, uh, in that it says uh, he was made a, uh, a little lower than the angels. Uh, uh, let, me, let me read from uh, Young's Literal Translation, and uh, that's a, uh, a good uh, translation, by the way, for studying. If you, if you don't use Greek and uh, can't get into Greek concordances and all that kind of stuff, uh, which you don't really have to know Greek to study from Greek, uh, but if you're not ready to go there, get you a Young's Literal Translation, and uh, it'll do a pretty good job of going uh, with the Greek. Now, I don't recommend you use a Young's Literal Translation for uh, sitting here in church, uh, for, for example, or just... Uh, your, your everyday Bible reading, and the reason is that uh, Young, when he did it, he kept the Greek word order, which is very helpful uh, for studying the Word of God, but it's not very helpful for reading the Word of God, because Greek word order and English word order aren't the same. So, uh, and, and yet, uh, it's, it is, you, you'll ha you, it's helpful, and you'll see it here. Uh, Young's uh, literal in Hebrews 2.9 says, And him who is made some little less than ma messengers we see, Jesus, because of the suffering of death, with glory and honor, having been crowned, that by the grace of God uh, for everyone he might taste death. Now, as you can see from that, it's not easy reading, is it? Uh, it's a very literal, uh, you know, rigid literal kind of a translation that is given. Uh, but uh, two things I want you to see. One is that uh, Young's goes the same way that I do, and he literally translated the word angelos instead of transliterating it. King James says made a little lower than the angels. Young says made a little lower than the messengers, because angelos is translated to mean messengers. Uh, and uh, angel is really a, somewhat of an interpretation. So uh, him who is made, uh, what I want you to notice is some little less. Him who is made some little less than the angels. Now, that's again, that's not good good English, is it? <laughs> what do you mean he was made some little less? Uh, and King James, again, just says, uh, uh, what is it? He was made a little lower than the angels. But King James actually left out, they didn't translate a word, and it's a little word T, uh, it's a little word that, uh, that Young's translated some. 
They just left out some little less, and he was made a little less or a little lower than the angels. New American Standard Bible uh, wasn't sure what to do with it as well, and so they added he was made a little while lower than the angels. Uh, but it really is some little less or a little some less. Uh, is, uh, is what it says. Now, what is that, what is that in English? Uh, regardless of where you go, first of all, I would say that is always going to be somebody's interpretation because all we know is it was some little less. Some what? Some degree of a little less? Some time of a little less? What have we got here? Uh, and and the, the question is not actually answered uh, from the text, but he was made some little less, uh, a little lower, a little while longer. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the fact is that all we know is there was a lowering from the messenger. Uh, was it a lowering in status? Was it a lowering for time? He was made some little less. How's that? <laughs> than the messengers. And... Uh, being made uh, some little less, uh, it goes on to conclude uh, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, again, the heart of the sentence is Jesus was crowned with glory. And he was uh, crowned with glory, even though you see him little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. And... Uh, all of this was that his death would actually accomplish something because it says in the end that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, first of all, uh, notice again, what is it that enables the death of Jesus Christ to uh, be effective for us? And that is, it is by the grace of God. And uh, here, uh, so thoroughly all through uh, Scripture, there is this emphasis that the death of Jesus Christ is all about grace, uh, that it is a, a, a penalty paid by someone uh, who didn't have to pay it on our behalf, and yet uh, he, he did. Uh, and so he, uh, he tasted or experienced uh, death for every man. I want you to notice there again uh, that he did it. Uh, he tasted death for whom? For every man, not for some men, but he tasted death for every man. And uh, I may have mentioned this uh, last week briefly in passing that, uh, that uh, really it's, uh, it is in the masculine, but the word man is not actually there. It uh, says for everyone, and it's, it's used in the generic kind of sense that until just a few years ago when political correctness came in, we used to say too. Uh, and uh, every man just, of course, means everyone. It's very clear in Greek. So he tasted death for everyone. As we talked about Wednesday night, uh, that, that is a rejection of limited atonement then that says he tasted death for some people, that is the elect. But this uh, scripture says that he tasted death for every man. Now, can, uh, now that I've uh, gone through verse 9, can some of you see why sometimes I don't keep on schedule and make it uh, through? Because we've just spent, uh, I don't know, close to 30 minutes on one little verse there. But it's a complicated verse. It has so much uh, in it that I uh, think is uh, powerful. Now, uh, there's an explanation of his death in verse uh, 10, where it says, For it became him from whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Does anyone predict this one might take a little time too? <laughs> because you look at that and say, okay, I'm not exactly sure what uh, this means. Uh, what do you mean it became him? Um, that... Uh, uh, that uh, particular uh, phrase there, it became him. Um, we don't use the term very often, but uh, uh, we used to we used to use the word behooved. <laughs> it behooved him. Uh, and I think some of the translations might say, and my literal translation here in a moment is going to say, it was fitting for him that this, w this was the right thing for, for him. Uh, this was advantageous even to him is, uh, is the idea. Uh, so we have, uh, again, a, uh, a subject of our sentence, and that is, uh, who, who's, the, who's the one for whom it was fitting? Well, the one for whom it was uh, fitting, or it became, or it behooved, is uh, the one from whom are all things and by whom are all things. Now, who's that? 
That's is Christ Jesus we're talking about. So uh, there's the descriptor of him. He's, uh, for all things are from him. All things are to him. And yet with all of this, it was fitting for him to do something. It behooved him to do something. It was appropriate for him to do something. It was uh, advantageous for him uh, to do something. And uh, so the verb uh, to the subject is it is, it, it is uh, fitting or it became him in, uh, in King James. Uh, and uh, uh, he is... Uh, uh, all, all things are, are, are by him and all things are to him. And uh, then there's this little statement here in bringing many sons into glory. So he, all things are in him, all things are to him, and he's brought many things into glory. These are three things we, we know about him. Uh, and having all things by him, to him and bringing many sons into glory, now it behooved him to, uh, to, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. You still don't get it because it's a complicated sentence, right? <laughs> so, okay, now uh, what is it? Uh, let's keep going. Try this uh, literal translation that I've given you here. Uh, it is fitting for Christ to complete through sufferings the author of their salvation. This is fitting because Christ is the one of whom is all and through whom is all, and he has already led many sons to glory. So, being the one of whom is all, through whom is all, already having led many sons to glory, now it's fitting for him to complete the sufferings. Uh, to complete the sufferings of whom? Towards the end of verse 10. Yeah, the author of their salvation, or in King James, the captain of their salvation. Uh, so it, it really is more of a, uh, a, a ruler kind of word. So I think captain is probably a good uh, term here because it has to do with leadership. Uh, so you, you might be saying, oh, wait a minute. Who is the captain of their salvation or the author of their salvation? Jesus. And it says it's now fitting for him to make perfect the captain of their salvation. I thought Jesus was perfect in the beginning, wasn't he? So how does a perfect person become more perfect? That, of course, is an impossibility. That, that implies he was not perfect to begin with. Uh, but uh, if we uh, read it with uh, just a little bit of a uh, different accent there, uh, and, and, and again change the word order uh, just a little bit, uh, what if we say... Uh, to bring to perfection or uh, to perfect. Uh, and what we have here is the idea that have you perfected, uh, if, you're, if you're, you know, building something or whatever, have you perfected it before you finished? No. You've got all the pieces, you've got everything together. Uh, but there's more to accomplish. And this is what is, uh, is the point here. So uh, this, this tells us that, let's take the bringing many sons to glory. Ha has, uh, has Jesus, uh, before his crucifixion, which is what we're talking about, so it, uh, it was fitting for him to die, basically, in order to perfect the captain of their salvation. Uh, well, before he died, had he brought any sons to glory? Well, that's what we want to say, <laughs> but this says, actually, having brought many sons to glory. So it tells us somehow he did, which means we have to uh, stop and question our assumptions <laughs> because we are assuming, again, as we so quickly do, to bring to glory means to, to, to save them, to take them to heaven. You know, he's gone on to glory. Uh, but... Is that, always, you know, is that all that it could mean? And we go back and look and say, well, now wait a minute. The, uh, the Hebrew nation, which we're talking about here, was brought from slavery into the promised land, wasn't it? And uh, you remember you had that uh, pillar of cloud uh, by day and a pillar of fire by night that was leading them through the wilderness. And uh, I think, I don't have time to, to uh, verify this to, to you, but uh, I, I think that that pillar of cloud and those, those visible aspects of God's glory was actually uh, the, the, the Son of God leading them. And so 
uh, Jesus really did lead them from Egypt into the promised land. In a sense, you could say, hey, he's brought you to glory. There's a the passage that uh, um, Paul uses, talks about from faith to faith and glory to glory. Uh, so there's, there, there's lots of faith experiences and glory experiences that the Hebrew nation has experienced in the past, right? And who does the Hebrew nation give credit to for, for coming from slavery into the promised land? They would give glory to God, of course. Uh, and so the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, Now, doesn't it behoove him who's already brought many sons into glory to complete this, to bring it all to perfection, because is coming into the promised land with uh, Joshua, is that the ultimate glory? No. As soon as they got there, they had to conquer it, didn't they? <laughs> and as soon as they conquer it, conquered it, they had to settle it. And as soon as they settled it, they had to protect it. And uh, you, as soon as they protected it, they had to govern it. And, you know, all the things that it, uh, it, it kept having to, uh, to, to, to move on. And, of course, you get to Solomon's day, and uh, there's, you know, there's great glory, and there's the temple and all that. But was that the height of glory? No, uh, it, 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 uh, fi in a physical sense it might have been, uh, but, uh, but it certainly wasn't the fulfillment of all the prophecies. And so having brought them this far, it says, he had to go further. Now, uh, to uh, bring all that uh, down in verses 9 and 10 to say, what in the world does that say? Here's what it says. Hebrew nation, you're looking at Jesus only made some little lower than messengers. And you're not seeing any farther than that. It says, I want you to see that even though he was made some little lower, he tasted death for everyone in order that he might be crowned with glory and honor. And it was very fitting for him to do all this because now having done all that he has done in bringing uh, Israel into glory now he can perfect it now he can he can uh, satisfy it all now he can bring it all to completion and he could have never done that had he not died on the cross and you're rejecting him because he died on the cross uh do you ever uh, I, uh, I notice this as a pastor sometimes. Uh, people get upset uh, at the pastor or the church or whatever uh, for, for doing that which, th which cannot be done. Or Let me say that different. I said that wrong. They get upset with the pastor or the church for not doing that which cannot be done. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, uh, I, this, this is true with uh, politicians. It's true with uh, decision makers. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, go where angels fear to tread now and talk local politics. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I really don't um, care which way you feel about this, but of course, uh, the city is all in an uproar about a new grocery store. Uh, and how dare the politicians have already talked to them before they bring up uh, this uh, out to the voters. That's an, that's an example of getting upset with someone for not doing that which can't be done. <laughs> because if you don't uh, lay some groundwork underneath, then what happens? They're all, well, what do you think you're doing? Some harebrained idea that you haven't even thought through. <laughs> so it becomes a no-win situation, doesn't it? Uh, now, I, w I would say this is, uh, this is the need for uh, total honesty all the, way, uh, all the way through. When you're honest in things, uh, then uh, sometimes you can deal with that. And there's always going to be someone upset about something, right, for politicians. Uh, uh, this is a political lesson for our soon-to-be congressman, Michael Romero. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, he, here he's saying, hey, look. Jewish nation, you're upset with him uh, for, 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 uh, for dying, and yet he can't be the Messiah without dying. This, this, this is illogical is what he's saying. And Hebrews, I have maybe more than any other book in the Bible, is a logic book. It is a, it's a book of a lawyer giving his case and laying it out before the jury, and the jury happens to be the Hebrew nation here. And he's trying very logically to say, here's the reason why you need to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. And uh, he gives these, uh, these reasons uh, right here. Uh, and uh, let's go on uh, in verses uh, 11 through 13, which we won't spend much time on. Uh, it says... Uh, uh, for both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified 
are all of one. Come on in. We'll finish our Bible study here in just a moment and be ready. Uh, For he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Uh, Now, this is very interesting that he uh, comes together and he says, uh, he says, I, I am the one who sanctifies, that is, make holy. And you, Hebrew nation, are the one that's going to be sanctified. And you and I are all, it says, of one. All of one. Well, uh, you, of course, that begs the question, all of one what? All of one pie, all of one race, all of one humanity, uh, New American Standard inserts the word father, all of one father. What, what, what are we here? Again, you have, to, you have to figure that out yourself because uh, uh, the, the uh, actual Greek doesn't, doesn't uh, tell us. But they're all of one. And in bringing many sons, in, uh, oops, I, I jumped a verse, uh, verse 10. Uh, they're all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. This is why New American Standard inserts the word father. They're all of one father, so he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Uh, now, th- this is uh, powerful. He says, even though you rejected him, he still calls you what? My brothers. Remember uh, when Jesus said, uh, whatever you have done unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done unto me. Uh, and he, he, he says he's not ashamed, uh, even though there's this rejection. He's not ashamed to call them brethren. And uh, then in verses 11 and 12, and we'll pick up there next, uh, next week, uh, in verses uh, 11 and 12, he uh, gives, uh, so he proves that they're all of one. And uh, he gives a couple of quotes in verses 12 and 13 from, uh, from the uh, Old Testament. Uh, there. And actually, I think uh, I'm going to let you study that on your own. We're going to pick up in verse 14 next week, uh, which uh, talks about this flesh and blood Messiah. Uh, We've talked about him crowned with glory and honor. Now we're going to talk about him in verses 14 and 15 being uh, flesh and blood Messiah. Well, we are uh, out of time uh, this morning. Thanks for being here for Bible study.